Welcome to Magnetic Forces on Current Carrying Wires. A short story by Mr. Mark. Previously on Magnetic Forces. Last time, we learned that when you have charges that are moving in a magnetic field, they will experience a force due to that magnetic field, provided that they're moving perpendicular to the magnetic field. And so we drew simple pictures like this, and we figured out how big that force was using the force equals QVB equation, and we figured out the direction using the right-hand rule. So for simple review, something like this picture, you point your thumb to your right, index finger into the screen, your middle finger points upwards, so the force on this particular charge would be up. The same thing is going to apply if we take those charges and we trap them in a wire. In that situation, we would call it a current. And so in today's lesson, we're learning about the magnetic forces on current carrying wires. So here's a long wire. There's a current moving through it. And there are the charges that are actually moving, and that's what's creating the current. Remember, a current is just a movement of positive charges. And so if we put those um, charges through a magnetic field, they are going to feel a force due to that magne magnetic field because they're moving perpendicular to it. If you were to do the right-hand rule for that situation, your thumb would go to the right, pointer finger would go upwards, and so your middle finger would be pointing out of the page. So those charges would feel a force out of the page. Since they're trapped in the wire, they're not going to move in circles, you're just going to see the wire kind of bow outward um, from the screen as a result of that force. The way that we'd find how big that force is is basically to sum all the forces on all those charges. That would tell you how big that force is. So same idea, just a slightly different result. Instead of the charges moving in a circle, we would just see the wire move a little bit to the, um, in this situation, out of the page. So here's a few illustrations. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got a magnet, which is creating a magnetic field going into the page. And then there's a wire running up and down. In the first situation, there's no current going through that wire, so there's no force on it. In the second situation, the current is going upwards, and so if you point your thumb up, magnetic fields into the page, so pointer finger goes into the page, your middle finger should be pointing to the left. And so you would observe the wire bows out due to a force on it to the left. In the third situation, now the current goes downward, so if you reverse the direction of your thumb, while keeping your pointer finger into the page, now we would experience a force to the left, and we would observe the wire bow out to the left. So just some simple illustrations of what's going on. So let's kind of see how big that force would be. So here's our picture again, a couple of charges moving through a magnetic field. We know the force on an individual charge is given by the equation Fb equals QVB. Remember that the current, I, is equal to charge over time, how many charges per second. And so if we multiply both sides by T, we can write Q equals I delta T. And so instead of uh, Q, I'm going to write I delta T. And then let's leave the VB part alone. Also remember that velocity can be expressed as displacement over time. So if we choose the displacement to be L, where L is the length of the wire that's actually in the field, we can write that equation like V equals L over delta T. And so in time delta T, we would have Q number of charges moving through that distance L. So those two delta T's right here and right here are going to be the same. And so that means when I substitute in the L over delta T thing into that equation, I can then cancel out those delta T's. And we get a relatively simple relationship, FB equals ILB. I for current, L for the length of the wire in the field, and B for the magnetic field. 
And so that's how I'd find the force on the wire in the magnetic field. Now the force outside, or the, excuse me, the wire outside the magnetic field would not feel a force. And so this just tells us the force on the length of wire L that is in the magnetic field. To find the direction of the magnetic force, we keep doing the same thing we've been doing. We use the same right hand rule. So your thumb still represents the direction the charges are moving. The only difference, practically speaking, is that instead of that being a velocity arrow, now it's going to be more like a current arrow. It tells us the direction the charges are going. Your index finger still represents the direction of the magnetic field, and your middle finger still represents the direction of the magnetic force. So the only thing that's changed, possibly, is you have to recognize currents telling you the direction rather than a velocity. So, a real simple example. Let's suppose that we have uh, two meters of wire, which is a pretty long length of wire, in a six tesla magnetic field directed into the page, which is a really big magnetic field, and it carries four amperes of current directed to the right. And what we want to figure out here is what is the magnetic force on the wire. And so using our brand new shiny equation, all we have to do here really is substitute, so current times length times magnetic field, and we would get something in the neighborhood of 48 newtons. So notice we had to have a really big current, a really long wire, and a super huge, ridiculously ginormous magnetic field to get a force of 48 newtons, which is about the weight of uh, 50 paper clips, give or take. So put 50 paper clips in your hand, and that's how big that magnetic force is. Don't forget about the direction. If you point your thumb to the right, your pointer finger into the screen, then your middle finger should be pointing upwards. So the force on this thing would be up. So you might see that wire bow up just a little bit. A couple of cool things we can make out of this. The first really cool thing that we can make out of this whole magnetic force thing is something called a railgun. And a railgun works by taking two conducting rails, setting them parallel to each other, and then applying a magnetic field across the rails like that, and then pointing the, putting the thing that you want to move so that it connects the two rails. So that means it's got to be made out of some sort of conductor. So let's just say that it's a, some sort of conducting projectile. We're going to launch this thing off, this, off these rails. And then we connect the other end of the rails with some sort of voltage source, EMF source, so that when we make the final connections, we close the final switch, we get a big current running through a loop that includes that EMF source, the rails, the rails between the EMF source and the projectile, and the projectile itself. So the current would do something like that. And so if you look at the current inside the projectile, it's going downward, point your thumb down, index finger into the page, your middle finger would point to the right. And so there would be a magnetic force on this thing directed to the right. And so, big force directed to the right, that thing is going to accelerate to the right. And so it's pretty simple in principle to make a rail gun. The problem is getting a magnetic field and a current that's big enough to get enough energy out of that to make it actually worth your while. Something that um, the good old United States Navy happens to be working on at the moment. So that's a railgun. Simple in principle, the problem is getting really, really big magnetic fields and really, really big currents that you would need to actually shoot something with enough energy to be any, um, be any use. The other really cool thing, and this is something that's much more common to our everyday lives, is something called an electric motor. The way that a motor works is you take a coil of wire, bend it up into a loop, kind of like that. So this is like a square shape, make it easier to look at. And then you place it in a magnetic field. So this magnetic field, I'm just going to go ahead and direct to the right. And then connect the bottom with some sort of voltage source again, like a battery. And when you do that, you're going to have current running in a circle 
or in this case a square, throughout the loop. And so if you do your right hand rule for the various sides of the loop, at the top of the loop there wouldn't be any force due to the magnetic field because the field and the current are parallel to each other. On the right side, the magnetic force would be out of the page. Thumb goes down, it pointer finger goes to the right, and so your middle finger for force should be sticking out of the page. On the bottom, there's no force, because again, they're parallel to each other. And then if you do your right hand rule on the left side, you would get a magnetic force going into the page. And so the net effect, you have one side being pulled out of the page, the other side being pulled into the page, the net effect is you're going to have a torque on the loop, and it's going to start to rotate. And so it's going to rotate um, you know, around a line drawn through the middle, something like that. So now that this thing is rotating, you can attach something else to it, um, and you can make that something else move. The simplest operation would be something like a fan. If you were to attach a piece of wood right here, and a piece of wood right here, then those things would spin around and basically you've created a simple fan. It's a lot easier than fanning yourself with your own piece of wood. Attach it to a motor, let the motor do the work. Um, and so that's a really, really big thing, because now we can move things using electricity, um, make things rotate, and now we can do work, mechanical work, using electricity. So again, net effect, take electrical energy, convert it to mechanical work. Super cool, super useful, we do it all the time. And so here's a simple um, breakaway cutout picture of an electric motor. You're going to notice lots and lots and lots of coiled up wire. The coils at the top are there to create a magnetic field, kind of like the solenoid that we saw in class, the thing that moved the nail in and out of the coil of wire. The coils that are like what I drew are down here in the middle. Those are the loops of wire. And if you look kind of closely at that, you'll notice that there's loops of wire going in a bunch of different directions. And so instead of having just one loop of wire, if you do a bunch of loop of wires that are kind of staggered a little bit, then you can increase the amount of energy you get out of your motor. And so instead of it just spinning around half a turn before it can actually go through the magnetic field again, it's continuously going through the magnetic field because you've got a lot of loops of wire. So instead of having just one loop of wire like that, you have multiple loops of wire in different planes. It increases the, efficient, or the energy you get out of the motor. That's all for this episode of Magnetic Forces. Join us next time when we learn how to do all this backwards and convert electrical or mechanical work back into electrical energy. Ta-ta.